Mental Health in America. Good evening and thanks for joining us for this special Faith Nation from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. I'm John Jessup. Well, America is in a mental health crisis and black men are one of the groups most affected. They're also least likely to seek help. Now that's beginning to change though as more than find healing by opening up about their struggles. CBN's Charlene Ayer reports. Statistics show only 8% of men in the U.S. seek counseling or therapy. Experts cite reasons can vary from societal pressures and fear of vulnerability to shame and religious barriers. One former Green Bay Packer turned mental health therapist is pushing back against that narrative. For Jay Barnett, playing football became an identity. When his NFL career ended, depression set in. He then tried to take his own life. When football fell apart and, and when I got sent home, I fell apart. Yeah. Uh, and that was when I attempted my, my first, I had my first attempt. Like many black men, Barnett struggled growing up without a father. He also endured abuse at the hands of his stepfather, hiding that pain for years out of fear of appearing weak. The way we're socialized as men, um, the way in which we have been developed uh, to not really focus on our emotional and our mental uh, elements of our development, we're taught to focus on the physicality, right? Getting in the gym, building muscles, becoming faster, all those different things. And no one is really helping us define what it is when it comes to our emotional parts. And so you, we. Every man, I'm sure at some point in his life, has heard men don't cry and the, or man up. Now a licensed mental health therapist, Barnett argues that's why so many black men struggle mentally and emotionally, something recent statistics seem to confirm. While overall U.S. suicide rates have decreased in recent years, numbers are rising in the black community. A 2021 study found black men had a larger increase in suicide attempts than any other racial group. Attempts in black male adolescents increased by 47 percent from 2013 to 2019. The rates are increasing daily because so men feel like they can't um, share what they're feeling because their masculinity is going to be questioned, their sexuality is going to be in question, and then you're you know weak. how their 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 weakness and 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 what I share with brothers, there's this thing about vulnerability that I've discovered that it's not displaying how weak we are; it's actually displaying playing, displaying how strong we are. In a 2022 interview, actor, comedian, and gospel singer David Mann revealed his secret battle with depression. It's touchy for me because I haven't shared it with anybody. I said it, the only way people were going to realize that I was drowning is if I completely drowned. Oh. And I was like, wow. And I can't say anything to anybody because I got to make sure you're fixed. I got to make sure you're, you're good. good. I got to make sure everybody's good. And it just hit me, and I was like, I need to see a therapist. Award-winning Christian singer Anthony Evans struggled with his mental health after the loss of several loved ones, including his mother. I've taken steps in my life via, via therapy, which I had to go. I mean, after all this stuff, I was like, I'm about to lose it. Like, it's, it's too much. It was, and we all have those points in life where it's just too much, you know? And I had to make a decision, am I going to allow this too much to... to take me down or am I going to do what I can? And, and there were moments where all I had was it took everything in me to sit down with my therapist and talk through this stuff. Evans says stigma in the African-American community often prevents men from seeking treatment. I think it's one of the most impo important things, one of the most important things, period, as related to culture, but especially in African-American culture, because sometimes it can be like, no, uh, it'll be, it's a harder stance against it. But the, the change that we need to see in our culture in general, to me, comes from you being not only healthy spiritually, but mental health and spiritual health and emotional health are all tied together. As a believer, he admits faith isn't always enough, something he wrote about in his book, When Faith Meets Therapy. There's something in our culture, and in faith culture even, that goes like, uh, no, like you pray. Pray harder. And for some of us, and I'm, I'm careful when I say this because I don't want it to sound bad, but, but for some of us, 
reading Be Anxious for Nothing is not enough. You need tools on how to be anxious for nothing, or tools on how to forgive, or tools on how to love correctly, or tools on how to undo trauma. Barnett agrees. I, I, I'm not saying that prayer doesn't work in the scope of mental health, but sometimes you need to couple it with Absolutely. counseling, which provides clarity and context. Today, Barnett hosts a global initiative called Just Heal Bro, designed to help black men find strength in vulnerability and healing through education and community. Evans says seeking professional help isn't a sign of weakness, but a sign of someone serious about moving forward emotionally and spiritually. I had to get almost to the point of a breakdown to admit that. So yes, that was hard because that wasn't necessary. I didn't have to go all the way to the point of almost losing my mind and my career and my ministry to figure out that you needed help. And now I want, through the music or through the, the book, When Faith Meets Therapy, I want people to not have to go to the point of a breakdown to figure out they need help. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. Well, loneliness can be as bad for your health as smoking up to 15 cigarettes a day. That's according to the Surgeon General. The good news, there are ways lonely people can improve their health and emotional well-being. Medical reporter Lori Johnson explains. Like millions of Americans, Ann Hales knows the depression and anxiety caused from feeling isolated. Well, I was at home, no one there but myself, and it was so lonely I just didn't know what to do. An introvert by nature, and stepped out of her comfort zone by joining a church sewing ministry. And I've met so many people. My horizons have been broadened, and I don't have that loneliness anymore that I had before. It was terrible. Anne's story shows how in-person social connection really helps. Church is what's known as the third place, right behind home and work. People who regularly go to their third place tend to experience less loneliness and have overall better mental health. Other third places range from clubs to community centers to coffee shops. This might be going to the small group. This might be adding an accountability group. Or it might just be a conversation on your back porch with a couple friends as long as you have it regularly. In his book, Made for People, Justin Early says God's plan involves living in community. We should understand friendship not as a luxury, but as a necessity to live in the good life physically and spiritually. He believes the goal of regularly getting together with friends is vulnerability that ultimately leads to intimacy. There's a difference between looking out into the world side by side, and that's meaningful and turning to each other and saying, now let's talk about each other. Don't make the mistake, however, of substituting online connections with the real thing. There are studies that show that, you know, the receptors in our brain, as we scroll through reels and, you know, we get likes on certain things, there are centers in our brains that light up for that. But that's all short-lived, and all of a sudden we're programming our brain to have these responses from a screen. Doctors say even a little personal interaction is better than none at all. It's okay to say hi to a stranger. Just a smile, just a quick hello. You don't know what they're dealing with that day. Not only is it good for your mental health, but it's probably great for theirs as well. And kids feel lonely too. It's so easy nowadays for families to come home and they just sort of isolate all separately into their own bedrooms and usually online. Parents can help by getting kids together with their friends. Make your home the place that you invite the friends over, buy a bunch of snacks, and maybe they watch a movie. But you got to take the phones out of their hands. And for inspiration, Americans can look to Israel, which has next to no self-reported loneliness. Communities don't create rituals. Rituals create communities. In his book, The Genius of Israel, Dan Senor points out how Israelis bond over regular Hebrew rituals such as Shabbat. And if you go walk by any home in Israel on a Friday night, you will see whether they're secular Jews or they're very religious, traditional observant Jews, they're all doing the same thing. And so there's this weekly ritual that brings people together. He adds that Israelis see connecting to each other as part of something larger than themselves. The whole notion of living in Israel is about togetherness and not just about doing whatever you do successfully on your own.
So in America, where many continue to struggle with loneliness, experts recommend a course correction by putting down the phone and prioritizing in-person relationships. Lori Johnson, CBN News. A nationwide anxiety epidemic. Is the church failing to deal with this major issue? That story, next. Welcome back. It's a staggering statistic. One in five adults struggles with mental illness each year, and not even the church is immune. Many Christians also face that same struggle. Still, there's a stigma around seeking counseling. That's particularly true in churches. Heather Sells introduces us to a pastor and his congregation who are fighting for hope in the face of despair. As a college senior, Dakari Middlebrooks got a dreadful call. His best friend had been murdered. This led to three years of violent nightmares when finally a seminary professor suggested therapy. Middlebrooks rejected it flat out. I said, I appreciate your suggestion, but black people don't go to uh, counseling. We just pray about it. The government estimates that each year, 48 million struggle with anxiety disorders and millions with challenges like major depression, post-traumatic stress, and bipolar disorder. For the young, mental illness can turn deadly. Suicide is the second leading cause of death for ages 10 to 34. Fortunately, Middlebrooks did make his way to a therapist. I went to counseling and I, I enjoyed it. It was the, uh, the greatest two and a half years of my life. He began attending a church with a pastor who openly talked about his struggle after his first wife died. Went through an incredible loss in my life and found myself in a place of depression and didn't realize what it was. I knew I was in a dark place. Bishop Walker also eventually sought out counseling. And as he healed, he realized his own church needed a wake-up call. I think that there is in the African-American community um, this whole idea that, you know, this, this phobia, this stigma, you know, if you get counseling, you know, you're crazy. Research shows that people who are struggling with their mental health often turn first to their church. That's an enormous opportunity. Now remarried, Bishop Walker and his wife, Dr. Stephanie Walker, a pediatrician, are bringing mental health to the forefront. They started Church Fit at Mount Zion, offering classes and programs on total physical and mental health. This includes a push from the pulpit in an effort to fight the stigma. We now make it a part of our everyday conversation as opposed to something that's whispered or something that's talked about only in the corner. It's a part of the everyday conversation. So do you need help? How are you feeling today? And asking three questions beyond that, because what is the common answer? Well, I'm fine. Well, really, so tell me more. Psychologist Vanessa Bell attends Mount Zion and says the new direction has been huge. I think that's what he did. In essence, normalized it from the pulpit that, um, you know, what you're experiencing is real. We can pray about it, but there are also resources available. Dr. Walker has also developed a referral system so church members can easily find a counselor, psychiatrist, or support group. As a church, we don't have to recreate the wheel. The resources are out there. We have the people, they have the resources, we serve as connectors. And Mount Zion makes sure its people know how to help, ask the right questions, and not let go when someone is hurting. It's not an option to leave you. It's not an option to hang up the phone. It's not an option to tell you we, don't, we can't help you. Where do I need to send you next? And they're trained to figure out immediately in that moment what, 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 what are the next steps in terms of getting this person help and getting them connected. For Middlebrooks, he's gone from shame to healing to transparency. He writes about his journey in the new book, The Depressed Millennial, and he says he's seen a change in his church as well. I think the church is now aware that there has to be a space, and I think that's what we've been able to do here at Mount Zion is carve out a space for dialogue. Uh, a lot of people were afraid to share that I'm broken. Middlebrooks hopes more churches will adopt this model as they become aware of mental health needs in their congregations and communities. Reporting in Nashville, Heather Sells, CBN News. A God-sized vision to reach military families. See how Mana Church is providing a roadmap for spiritual and mental nourishment.
Mental health is often a private issue for America's service members. A North Carolina church has started a mission to reach the U.S. military around the world by planning a church close to as many bases as possible. Mark Martin has a story. From post-traumatic stress to longer and more frequent deployments away from family, it's clear our military men and women need support. And just like how God miraculously supplied food to Israelites in the wilderness, Mana Church is stepping up to provide spiritual and mental nourishment for those who serve our country stationed around the world. I think it speaks to the power of a promise from God. I believe that God gave my dad a vision, God gave my dad a promise, and I think that it's been my honor to lay my life down to fulfill the vision that God gave my dad. Mana Church, pastored by Christopher Fletcher, is in Fayetteville, North Carolina, near Fort Liberty, one of the Army's largest installations. Fletcher says God gave to his father, Michael, a vision of how to reach the military almost a decade ago, after the church lost more than 1,100 people to military transfers in just one year. And so he kind of sat back in his chair and said, you know, this, this is crazy. Like, I don't, how, how are we going to build a church this way? We're sending people that God's beginning a work in to, to nobody. There are great churches at, at military bases. I'm not saying that, but uh, he said, I'm tired of sending us to nobody. And so that vision was really birthed in December of 2014. And from that point forward, we've been seeking to plant an expression of Mana Church near every U.S. military installation in the world. That would entail church plants near 273 bases that Fletcher calls the military highway. The thing I love about 273 is it's not a vision I can accomplish. It's not wisdom that is going to be somehow inherent in me that's going to come bubbling to the surface. It requires God to move. That sort of drive gets me up in the morning. I think more believers should have God-sized visions that are terrifying when you look at them. Currently, there are 33 expressions of Man and Church near U.S. military bases. As shown in the map behind me, the greatest concentration is here in North Carolina and in Virginia, but locations are spread out around the country and even overseas. Army Reservist First Lieutenant Todd Capon is a site pastor in North Carolina while Air Force Special Operations veteran Riley Halliday is a lead pastor in Virginia. So when a, a military family gets orders to move, we can already set them up. They already have a network of, of people that they can plug into. They don't have to worry about the, the church search or finding a church that believes the same things. Uncle Sam, who's kind of become our mission sending organization uh, because he takes great talent at people and relocates them. So that's kind of the, the vision. We have everything from microsites, which you might think of a house church. Um, they're live streaming or they're watching one of our city sites where there's a lead pastor, someone in my role who does preaching, teaching, discipling. Um, and then obviously if a church grows to the right scale at a multi-site where there's multiple campuses in a city. Military personnel get their orders to another location as often as every two years. So having another man at church to walk into provides continuity and support. Both executive pastor James Lewis and his wife served in the military and know what it's like to pick up and move multiple times. My wife and I were both out in Colorado for about four years and then we moved here um, in 2000 to Fort Bragg and uh, we stayed here for six years but then we moved to Kansas so we were in Kansas for two years. We moved back here to Fort Bragg for three years um, to include us, my second deployment. Then after Fort Bragg for that second time, uh, we moved to Baltimore where I taught ROTC at Morgan State University. And then um, I went to Korea and my family moved back here to Fort Bragg. So we were separated for a full year. And then I came back to Fort Bragg in 2015 and then we retired in the next year in 2016. And that's just one example of what can be the life of a military family. So having the same type of church in different locations is definitely welcomed. It's amazing. It is, um, it's a comfort um, because again, you move, you're, you're away from family, but yet knowing that your church family is gonna be there wherever you are um, is, is, is amazing. To be able to transition from, um, from one base to another base and just to know that there's a church with that exact culture um, there's, like I say, it's a great thing. Retired Army veteran Sabrina Bentley Thompson leads MANA's kids program in Fayetteville. Moving can be especially hard for children, having to make new friends and getting adjusted to new teachers. It's probably harder on the kids than it is on the parents. Um, knowing that um, you're changing stations, you're going somewhere else, 
And just to know that, hey, um, I'm used to this. Familiarity, community, mental and spiritual nourishment, all elements of stability that Mana Church provides for military families on a journey full of unknowns. Mark Martin, CBN News, North Carolina and Virginia. Coming up, mental health and teenagers, some statistics you should know about. And finally tonight, researchers say mental illness is skyrocketing among teens and smartphones are to blame. Furthermore, many are turning to their favorite social media apps to get mental health advice. A new study from Ed Week Research Center found more than half of students use apps like TikTok to self-diagnose mental illness. And 65% of teachers say they've seen the phenomenon in their classrooms. Experts warn that's a big problem because teens can easily misdiagnose themselves or pursue medications that aren't right for them. But some note the solution isn't to take away their phones, but to make professional help more accessible. And that's going to do it for tonight's Faith Nation. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great night.